Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel for Sunday night. Oh, we're going to have a really good show tonight. I've uh, asked our presenter tonight, Dave Rowe, from Plane Wave Instruments, to tell us about uh, what he's going to talk about. And we've, we've settled on um, several topics over the last six weeks, month, whatever it's been. And I really don't know what he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, he's going to make it up as he goes along, and I'm sure he's going to have a good time doing it. So uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit about science and a lot about telescopes. He knows an awful lot about telescopes. Maybe he'll tell us a little bit about Columbia, because that's where he's working and living right now. Um, I don't know. We'll see what's happening. But uh, Dave's, Dave's um, got a lot of things to tell us. Before we go there, though, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And uh, there's a few things I got to tell you about. And do, doink, doink. And one of the things I want to do is to take you to the Astro Imaging Channel website. Oops, I don't want to do that. I want to come over here and take you to the calendar because I want to tell you about what's going to happen um, next week. Uh, today, David's here. Uh, Randy Barron's going to be coming up with us next week. Randy? You got you out there. Uh, I was yep. wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about what you're going to be telling us about next week. What is well, it that you're going to st start telling us about? Yep, I'm going to be telling you folks all about sketching and the reasons why all of you should consider taking up astronomical sketching. It will make you, first thing I can say right now is it will make you a better observer, without a doubt. And I look forward to maybe converting some of you to take up the hobby of sketching your astronomical objects. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, and let me get back to to um, my, I've got too many screens to mess with here and I'm not that smart, so it's hard for me to do. Um, I'll get back to sharing my screen. I got to take you back to the um, Astro Imaging Channel website. Am I sharing my screen successfully there, Molly? Yeah, we see it. Okay. Um, uh, Sean uh, is coming with us a week after that, and he's going to tell us about how to store your data. He's real um, excited about being back and going to tell us how to take care of all those files that we save and what to do with it. And then Danny's going to tell us about chasing the Aurora Borealis. I saw some of his pictures, and they're pretty cool. Uh, and then we've got some stuff about observatories and using PixInsight with the Hubble palette. And Bob Buckheim's going to be back telling us about how he built his observatory. And we've got some other people coming up, including Warren Keller and a little bit about 3D printing for astroimagers. So we've got some really cool stuff coming up. But you'll notice that after April 25th, we don't have any more things. So uh, <clears throat> we need more people to volunteer. We need you guys out there to volunteer. Also, you will notice, uh, let me see, oh, yes, the program database. Um, for those of you who haven't noticed it yet, we've talked about this a couple of times now, um, we've got a lot of programs, some 350-some programs, and um, it's hard to keep track of all the programs we've got, which ones are of use to you. But if you go to our website, um, <coughs> and you click on that link right there, spreadsheet, you will find a list of all the programs over the last, well, ever since our since we started doing this, so uh, seven years ago almost. And uh, you can click on a link and that link will take you right to the show. You can uh, download this um, uh, spreadsheet of your own and do your own research as to, as to what kinds of things you need to follow. So if you're looking for a particular program, Here's a good way to get into it, okay? And I wanted to bring it up particularly because uh, Wanda is helping us do this now, and you'll notice she's keeping it up to date for us. Wanda is a recent addition to the volunteering, joining Molly and Eric and Tolga and Terry and me, and I think I got us all. And um, we need more of you out there to help volunteer for doing this kind of stuff. So please come along. One other thing you'll notice is that if you go click on Orion time, you're not going to get into Orion time anymore. Okay, that's because Orion time is over. And Orion time has actually, this isn't the actual show. This is a draft of the show. And as you can see, we've got lots of Orion pictures. 
And uh, this is, we got to add some really cool music, you know, some royalty free music, you know, and we've got to add some titles and we've got to add some stuff and uh, it should be ready by next week. So we'll be showing that next week as part of the show. Lots of really good images of Orion. Um, oh, incidentally, it's like, what does my number say? 29 of just M42, where not much else in the picture at all, and 12 of portraits of, of uh, the horsey. And the nine, the, the flame and horsey was the next most popular with nine, I guess the sword, meaning the horsey, the flame, the horsey, and all the way down to uh, M42 was after that with 10 of them. So there's a whole lot of pictures for you to see next <clears> week, and we'll have this all timed up better and, and ready to show you, and everything will be spelled right, hopefully. Um, there is one fellow named um, Jorge uh, who sent me a link on YouTube, and Jorge, I tried getting back to you. We can't use a link, but if you've got something that you would like to contribute to us, um, Please get it to us. I, my, hey, Alex, my, Alex yeah. I have the capability to download YouTube videos, so I can. Yes, I can but we can't get a hold. But we can't get a hold of um, the the YouTube link won't work. And oh, okay. In addition to the other problems we've got, you know what okay. I mean. So, um, so I need to talk to Jorge, and I can't seem to get a hold of him because the email that I sent to him isn't working. So anyway. Uh, here we are looking at um, the YouTube page, and you can see that a bunch of you have already signed in. We've got 70 people watching right now. There's a place for you to ask questions over here. There's a place for you to um, oh, do all sorts of stuff. But one thing I want to tell you about that I don't know that I've told you about much yet, if you really want to be an astroimaging uh, channel, the astroimaging channel nerd, you can go to shop the Astro Imaging Channel apparel. And this is a new thing that Tolga has worked out for us. And you can get yourself T-shirts of various kinds and sweatshirts. And if you, um, you can get them in red and blue and black and pink. And, uh, you know, if you want to wear a TAIC logo on your shirt, cool. You can do that now. Okay. That... Uh, I was going to say, let me see, where am I? Chrome. I need Chrome up. There we go. Um, over here, you can put all your questions. All right. Be sure to put a big red mark in there like that. Okay. And that'll help us find the questions as we're trying to talk to you. And I think I've talked everything that I've got to talk about as way of announcements. Now we're up to 72 people. Dave's sitting there going, hey, wait a minute. I'm supposed to present today. How about letting me talk? So I'm going to stop sharing and take over, Dave. Okay. I would never say that, Alex. Oh. <laughs> let, let me figure this out. Let me share my screen. Um, I guess it's like that. Here. All right. And I'm apparently sharing my screen. So let's bring up a PowerPoint. All right. How does that look? That looks Everybody good here. See that? Good. Yeah, that looks good here. We're good. All right. So um, I'm Dave Rowe. I'm the CTO of Plane Wave Instruments there in Michigan. And I live in California. And right now I'm with my wife in Columbia. Uh, six degrees, six and a half degrees north of the equator. I wonder if who can identify my the city that I'm in right now. So I would love to talk to you about a bunch of things because telescopes are wonderful and they're fun and they're full of technology now. And um, so let's have fun doing this and please ask questions. I love interactive questions. I think um, it's a wonderful experience for everybody. The talk is kind of a potpourri and you should go look up where the word came from. It's French and it means um, something interesting. Uh, if you get a chance, go look it up. 
Um, so a brief introduction about me. We'll have we'll show a few great photos from plane wave telescopes. And I'll talk a little bit about the history and the technology that goes into plane wave telescopes. And then um, we're just in the very beginning of testing a brand new telescope called the Delta Rho 350. And it's a very fast telescope, uh, roughly 14 inches in diameter. And it should be a wonderful telescope for wide field um, astrophotography. And I'll talk a little bit about science programs that I enjoy and, and that can be done by amateurs with practically any size telescope. Um, my father bought me a department store <laughs> refractor when I was eight years old, and I had never seen a telescope before. And I pointed it out through the living room window at some stars, and everything was just this huge big blob. And I it didn't even, my father didn't know how to operate it either. I eventually figured out that you had to focus it first. And it wasn't, it was shortly after that that I um, understood that you actually had to take it outside. That if you look through the window glass, um, things didn't look too good. Um, I then actually saved a whole bunch of money and bought this telescope that you see there. What it was $369 apparently without the clock drive. I got the one with the clock drive and um, it was the white tube, not the red tube. And I truly loved that thing. I spent hours in the backyard and so forth. I strapped uh, my my Pentax film camera onto it and did pig piggyback photography and learned how to develop the film and lots of fun stuff. The first mirror I encountered was a mirror I found in a closet in the physics department at Bowling Green State University where I did my undergraduate work. And it was completely on, it had been polished out, but it was completely unfinished. Um, the guy had left uh, and he left this mirror and I built a Foucault tester from, I, I love uh, sky and telescope. And I, there were many articles about Foucault testing. So I built a tester and I actually figured my first mirror. Um, I never got it into a telescope. I put it back into the same um, cabinet <laughs> that I found it. So I often wondered uh, what actually happened to that mirror, if it ever got um, installed into a telescope or not. I uh, did my undergraduate work in physics and mathematics. And um, after that, I was an aerospace engineer for 10 years in Southern California and um, designed GPS receivers, some of the very early ones. This was from 1979 to 89. And had a lot of fun doing that. Learned, I mean, I didn't have any engineering training, but um, the, the physics and mathematics training um, served me very well. And then I started a company uh, called Sierra, Sierra Monolithics in 1989 with a couple of partners. Um, and we were quite successful. We designed integrated circuits for the internet for optical fiber interconnection. And um, then, then the company got sold and in the, and in the meantime, I, I actually was working with uh, the wonderful folks at Plane Wave probably since 1995 or 1996. I had built a, in 1995, uh, I had built an instrument called a Slavot camera. It's actually Eric Schmidt Cassegrain. So, it's a, a design that's kind of very constrained to be like F4, but it covers 
a perfectly flat field out to, you know, well, I had a, I had a medium format Hassie back, um, which was what, two and a quarter by two and a quarter inches. And uh, so I did a lot of film photography with that. Unfortunately, you know, I don't have a photograph of it, but um, a nine and a half inch uh, Slavote camera. And I brought it one day to El Camino College. And at El Camino, there was a group of of uh, guys working under uh, Professor Perry Hacking. And they were in the basement of the math department. And um, we'll get to that story in a second. And that's kind of how we uh, started uh, Plane Wave. First, since this is an astrophotography channel and I love photographs too, as much as you do. I'll show you some photographs of objects taken with uh, plane wave um, instruments. That's a beautiful one. A very fitting for Orion. One of my favorites, I think Don got the colors really beautiful on this one. Julian Hancock. This one was taken uh, with a CDK 700, which is an Altas telescope that comes with a mount. I'll describe that. These are spectacular. And this one is from, this is like the first 60 second exposure, I think, from an installation that we did in Chile with the uh, one meter telescope that we sell and only a six, 60 second exposure, a lot of, get a lot of photons. Huh? Okay, so let's talk about plane wave a bit. This is not an advertisement for plane wave. It's just, you know, really fun to talk about some of the technology that, that we've put into telescopes. Um, the company itself was started in 2006 legally by Rick and Joe. They worked for Celestron. Uh, Rick was one of the owners of Celestron at one point, marvelous guys. And, um, but really, the company, in a sense, started in the basement of the math building at El Camino sometime during the late 1990s. I think that's probably 96 through 2000. We spent countless hours talking about what we dreamed in a telescope. We were down in the basement, um, and it was a class that Perry Hacking was giving, and uh, we, we helped students make uh, six inch or eight inch uh, telescope mirrors. And then they built a telescope, a Dobsonian like instrument. And um, that's what they did in the class. And it was a huge amount of fun. I enjoyed it immensely. So where did it all really start? Well, well during the, the classes that, uh, that we were that we were teaching in the basement of the math building. We talked about building a big telescope. And Perry, if I have a mouse here, yeah. I hope you can see that. But this is Perry hacking. And that's a young version of me and Jason and so forth. Uh, Rick and Joe aren't in this photograph, but you'll see them in a minute. And so Perry had this dream of building a, um, you know, one meter or larger amateur telescope on a Altaz push push around mount, and we thought that was a great idea. So Perry, you know, wanted to build it, uh, it as a Newtonian, but I kind of convinced them that. Um, I didn't like the idea very much of a Newtonian and the coma corrector for a F3 or 3.3 Newtonian was, you know, a very expensive 
um, matter. A wind corrector is a expensive gadget. And so we talked about it for months. And I remember going into a Chinese restaurant with them during lunch after or during uh, the teaching experience. Um, and I convinced them to build a CDK. Uh, it's a design that I came up with specifically to solve this problem of having this huge Newtonian that you had to, you know, it took like a 10 foot ladder or something and a $10,000 wind corrector and so forth. So the configuration that I came up with is this one. It has the primary mirror has a conic constant that's somewhere between a sphere and a parabola. It's actually minus 0 0.65, if you know what that means. But it has a perfectly spherical secondary. And the reason I wanted a spherical secondary was I had learned by my own difficult trials with optics and so forth that making hyperbolic secondaries, like for a Richie Chrétien are very difficult things to make. And um, a sphere is like falling off a log optically. It's really easy to polish, uh, to figure, to, uh, to test. Um, and to make smooth um, spherical optics is very much easier than to make um, highly corrected spheres like, like those that go into a RC. Not only that, but the design happens to have a large and totally flat field, and it's free from coma and astigmatism. And part of the magic is down here. It's this little corrector. And so that's the origin of the CDK optical design. So guess what? We actually built one. We, we all chipped in some cash, and we sent it off to uh, Peter Wangsness in, uh, I think he was in Tucson, Arizona at the time, and he could spin cast mirrors. And so um, here's the blank that he created for us. Uh, well, here's the core of the, it's a, it, it's a light weighted mirror by casting. So just the way that they were doing it um, in the mirror making lab um, in Tucson, um, University of Arizona, and he just adopted that technology from the 8.4 meter mirrors they were making there at the time, and he uh, scaled it down to a meter. And so here's the cores, uh, and they they're they're removed. They're actually blown removed in some way. I don't remember how it's done. And and here it is filled with uh, borosilicate glass, and and he would put a top over it. And he'd actually spin this thing, and you got to get borosilicate up to like, I don't know, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit or something before it melts. So all the gadgetry that makes it spin has to be, um, uh, has to work at very high temperature. It's quite a job. In fact, it was such a job that we didn't get the mirror for, I think, three years. But, you know, it arrived. We ordered the blank in 97, and I think it was three years later. It might have been four. I'm not sure. Uh, Perry went out to um, uh, Arizona, Tucson, and picked it up and drove it back. And we started grinding. And, I mean, this we needed to remove, like, a millimeter of surface glass that had uh, th that wasn't usable as a mirror. There were bubbles in it and so forth. It might have been two millimeters. I mean, it was a tremendous amount of glass. That's Joe and um, some of our other colleagues that helped us uh, with the project. And the grinding, <clears throat> I don't know how long it took. I can't really remember, but it was months. It was many months, I, I think. So the process was, you know, one guy would grind and one guy would um, uh, 
shake on the grit from a, um, I don't know, glass jar or something. Um, this is Rick, young version of Rick and Jason. And there's Joe in the background. And we, every Saturday and or Sunday, you know, most of the weekend, almost every weekend, we'd be in there working on this uh, huge mirror. There's Joe with a serometer um, checking the radius of curvature. Um, that's that's me back there. Um, we're we're now figuring. We had polished the the thing, but we actually had polished it badly. I learned a huge amount. We all learned a huge amount about mirror making from this. Um, and three of us would Paul, we could get three people around here. We could actually get four if we tried hard, but generally we were three. So the mirror starts out as a sphere and you slowly um, change the conic constant of the mirror by removing glass from the edge in the center and not really touching it very much um, at the 70% zone. And on and on, here we are testing it. Jason's at the Foucault tester, which is propped up on a bunch of stuff. And Perry had the bright idea, Perry and Jason, maybe, maybe Joe too, of putting this on a barrel. So the barrel is actually filled with, I think, iron weights that Perry got from somewhere. There's 300 pounds roughly, um, of weights in the barrel and because the mirror how much did it weigh a couple of hundred pounds it took four strong guys to lift it so what's that 200 250 pounds and we'd flip it up and stabilize it and we could test it with our fuco tester this is one that i built for the purpose of testing the mirror and I wrote some software to do the analysis. This is the first version of a program that's lasted um, since that time, since 97 or 98. Um, I trained a lot of people how to use it. We used it in the mirror making laboratory. And <laughs> Yeah, the big spin. What we did was, unfortunately, we polished. We we didn't really know exactly what we were doing. For I mean, it's a big mirror. We didn't realize how flexible mirrors are and how flexible laps are that you build like this and so forth. So um, we 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 ground in and polished in or whatever a whole bunch of astigmatism that we had to get out, and we found various ways of testing the mirror for astigmatism. It was a real chore. Um, we ended up taking the mirror out at night and propping it up and using the second floor of the math building to actually um, put the test. <laughs> we, we had some crazy ideas, but we, we got it done. We, we found the astigmatism. And so we had to do this thing we called the big spin. We would do I have another picture of it? No, I don't. But we put the mirror onto this lap and we just spin it for hours. I mean, and then we would take it off and we would test it. And we'd see that the astigmatism had decreased a little bit. And then we would put it back on and we'd spin it again. And I don't know how long, months we did that for. We also made a spherical secondary. And this is the um, fringe pattern in white light, or actually light from a fluorescent light, that you would see when you put the, um, the convex secondary mirror against a, conve a concave match plate. And you can see in here that, it, that the figure is not too bad. The, the edge is turned down a little bit, but that, you know, that's so common. We actually improved on this. And the, there is another interesting aspect of this photo. You see these, these are coins. Those are pennies. We had to, mirrors are extremely 
flexible things on the level of, you know, a few tens of nanometers. So, and, and, I don't, and we didn't appreciate that. We didn't have any tool like SolidWorks or anything. And, and I had done some hand calculations and thought it would be okay. But, um, and it turned out to be fine in the end. But, you know, we had to very carefully prop up the, what you're looking at is you're looking, we're actually holding the match plate, the, the concave uh, mirror that we're testing the convex uh, secondary over. So we had to first stabilize that whole arrangement and so forth. And um, it was a great experience. And there we are. We finally got it done. We, we sent the check in 97 and we finished it finally in 2010. We're out here in the desert and it, it was so cold and windy that I slept in the back of my truck, which is here. It was so cold and windy at three o'clock in the morning, I just got up and left. It was impossible to sleep. I had two sleeping bags and it was just a horrible night. Middle of March, early March, I think. What is it? I didn't ask it to do that. Okay, so plane wave. What do we do? Well, we built that CDK uh, 42 and we, oh, it went into some kind of auto, what's it doing? Okay. And uh, Rick and Joe wanted to start a company and um, they got some money together and they designed, we designed together the CDK uh, 20 which I believe this is a drawing of. Of course, all Cassegrain telescopes look similar enough. I could have borrowed this from anywhere, but it does show a spherical secondary, the, the position of the corrector lens group and the primary mirror. The primary mirror is conical. And we had a, we had a, a, a colleague that we knew that did a little bit of FEA on it. And we found that this shape uh, worked very well as a as a shape to to hold um, by actually adhering it using um, silicone rubber RTB. We adhere it um, to to a very special uh, mirror cell that we designed along with this, and and that's worked so well. We've actually retained that idea uh, throughout the history of the company. The, this is the result from a CDK 12.5 over a full field of view of a, my goodness, what is it? This is, I borrowed this slide from another presentation, I think, yes, um, got confused. Okay, so the idea here is that this is along the way towards a perfect telescope. The first thing we wanted to do is to make sure that we had perfect stellar images in the corners over one of these huge chips. And this is for a fairly small telescope. It has an enormously well-corrected field of view. Um, it's, it's every bit as good as uh, Richie Chrétien. And, and with an RC, you've got to put a, a field flattener in it anyway, which is two or more elements. So, um, you see, you save, you don't save anything um, in an RC uh, unless you're just doing um, on-axis photography or something. The, the, um, the corrector does, in the, in the CDK, does all of the work, but you've got a much easier telescope to actually fabricate and much, much easier to collimate. One of the reasons I chose a CDK design was um, during this process of trying to figure out what to do with that 42-inch uh, telescope, um, I happened to have a visit with Tony Hallis, um, and he lived in Ojai, and I drove up there, and we had a wonderful afternoon conversation. And the conversation 
when something like this, he had a, uh, an RC. Um, and he said, he just complained for a long time about how difficult it was to call me. And we talked it through and, you know, sat outside and drank beer and had a wonderful conversation about how to call me an RC. Well, an RC, you've got to move the secondary mirror um, and you've got to center it very, very accurately. So really you've got five degrees of freedom that you've got to take care of uh, with a RC secondary. Why? Because the RC has to be centered on the optic, the, the secondary has to be centered on the optical axis. So that's two degrees of freedom, right? And then you've got to position it axially, and then you've got to tip and tilt it um, to, to collimate it to remove coma and astigmatism. So it's really a job to, to do it. It can be done, but it's you know not so easy. On the other hand, a CDK, um, I said, well, you know, why not? What are the options with a spherical secondary mirror? And so I had written a ray trace program and I started to um, do a lot of work. I put corrector lenses in different places and I found out that there were a, a lot of interesting solutions. But the one I liked best had the corrector uh, really close to the primary mirror because then you could mount the corrector lenses in a very nice mechanical spot. And that is you could hold it uh, using the primary mirror cell itself. So that turned out to be a really good idea. And that was really the birth of the CDK idea. David? Yeah. There was a question. Uh, you've mentioned a perfect telescope. What makes a perfect telescope? Thomas asks. Yeah, well, you know, that that's something I'm going to get to. <laughs> that, that's part of the that's part of the fun. So at first we didn't know really what a perfect telescope was going to be, but we knew it had to have great optics and it had to cover, you know, these large CCD chips that we're starting to see in the late 90s, right? And we knew it had to have excellent mechanics and it had to track really well. And we, we, we didn't want it to have any backlash. Um, and we, we, we would have loved to have had a telescope that you could turn on and it, it could find out where it was. You know, you didn't have to like align it because, you know, I'd carry that telescope out into the field, my Slavot, the concentric Schmidt Cassegrain. And I would spend an ungodly amount of time like polar aligning it and fooling with it, basically getting it to track. Uh, I had an auto, I had a ST4 auto guider. And, you know, if I, if I walked away from a weekend in a desert with that telescope with a couple of, of decent, you know, medium format photographs, I was totally happy. Um, so the perfect telescope was a bunch of different things, something that was easy to use that you could set up fast, that always worked, that had great optics and so forth, mechanically very stable. And at first we really didn't know, you know, what to do, but we figured it out along the way. Um, so I'm going to actually now talk about um, the plane wave 1000 because it's the kind of the end of the line of a long line of telescopes. We started making the CDK 20 OTA, and then we built a mount for it that was based on um, worm gears. And then we built probably the 12 and a half. I'd actually have to go back and ask Rick um, and Joe what the order was. I think we built the 12 and a half and maybe the 17, there's a 24, there's a 14. And then we graduated to the 700, which looks a lot like this telescope. It's a bit different, but it's the same idea. It's now 
an Altaz telescope because when you get big um, telescopes, you're talking about lots of weight. And to put this on an equatorial mount is just not feasible. It would cost many times um, what this telescope costs to make. So price is also, you know, a part of the equation, big part. So this is kind of the end of the line so far at plane wave and for, for this direction. This is still a CDK, and it has direct drive motors. It has uh, field derotators built in here. It has on-axis encoders that have, you know, a tenth of an arc second resolution and so forth. And it works really well. And we sold a bunch of these and customers are totally happy. So it has a very kind of classic optical, hmm, very strange. It has very kind of classic optical layout. It has a, a tertiary mirror, M3. It's a flat. And the flat directs the light uh, along the altitude axis and goes through a three element corrector now into the focal plane, lots of back focus. Um, the, the motor and derotator sits here and so forth. And we built it on the advice of um, Rush Janay, a very good friend of mine. And um, I'll talk about him a little bit more and Dan Gray also. But Russ kept telling me, look, you gotta build and we're, we're talking now about the predecessor to the one meter, which is the 700. But you got, he said, you got to build it with a, a dual focus. Um, you got you to move the, the tertiary and it's got to have two focuses because scientists love to put a bunch of instruments on this side and a bunch on this side. So that's in fact what we did. And here's the design that I came up with. Um, for the for the one meter, it it's all um, fused silica, and it's a just a classic CDK except I added a third element um, to the corrector uh, to increase the uh, uh, useful field of view out to a hundred millimeter diameter, and actually it's usable beyond that too. And it's a F6, which is quite fast for a uh, one meter telescope. You know, you're, we're usually dealing with F10 or 12 optical systems. Um, and it, it comes with a reducer if you want it to get you down to F4. So you can do wide field. So the, the the scientists like it because they can do um, a lot of things with it. Um, it can be used for discovery work and so forth. All right. The OTA, pretty obvious. We decided on using, a, yeah, we decided to use a, instead of the conventional big heavy fork arms, um, we decided to use an, a truss structure for the fork. And that has huge benefits. There's, many, there's great manufacturing benefits to this, but there's also um, weight. This greatly reduces the overall weight of the telescope and it, it puts the metal basically exactly where you need it to support the telescope. And that takes a, a load off of this bearing, a big load off of this bearing. So here's a part of the story that's kind of interesting. Um, Russ and I had talked on the phone many times about um, telescopes and optimal designs and so forth. And he went to a place called Magdalena Ridge in New Mexico. There's a 
there's a 2.5, I think, meter telescope up on this really windy ridge at nine or 10,000 feet. It's way up there. And he came back with the story of the fact that that telescope was driven directly. Um, there was no gearing system um, at all. And I had been playing with that idea. In fact, I had built a small direct drive motor, but I hadn't, I didn't get the whole concept correct. But then when we thought about it together, I, I, I got, I finally got the idea. You just build a, a torque motor, a motor that provides torque to the axis and you measure the axial position, the, the axis position with a, a very high quality encoder, highly accurate with high resolution. And you put a, you know, more or less conventional uh, servo controller between the two and you've got a, a telescope um, drive system that has no backlash. It has no gears. It, it, it has no actually... You know, there's nothing in contact with uh, other things that can wear out and so forth. So Dan Gray and I, I had met Dan Gray in 2005. And Dan designed the servo system that actually made it work. I built the first motor in my garage. Uh, it was a POS, but it proved the point. I mean, I made it out of stupid materials and so forth. Had a lot of trouble, but we finally got the idea. And then Plane Wave adopted it, and um, we started to use it in our maps. And it's a case where we took technology that the big telescope guys had been using for a number of years and we brought it down to um you know small um telescopes amateur sized maps and here's what it looks like here's a here's an actual solidworks rendering of the uh drive on the pw 1000 the, the one meter um, Altas telescope. This is the altitude drive. It has two sets of coils here. Th this part is the actual drive, and this part is the um, derotator. And this comes from the genius of Kevin Ayat. He's a wonderful guy. He um, knows SolidWorks in and out, and we work very closely together on the design of these things. And Kevin designs this, and we've got the machines that build all of this stuff, and it turns into a beautiful way to make a telescope drive. Here's an expanded view of showing the stuff that actually goes into that. Um, it not exactly a simple you know, project, but um, you get a great result when you're done. Here's the altitude motor being assembled. And um, you, you can see it's pretty big, right? For a one meter telescope, you need a lot, quite a lot of torque because you've got um, a large wind load and so forth and so on. So it can produce a beefy amount of torque. And it's called an axial flux motor. This motor design's been around, you know, forever. Mag it's a permanent magnet. There's the magnets. Axial flux, because the flux uh, of the magnets is going along the axial direction. And you can see the copper coils and so forth. And we drive it with a servo controller. And Dan and I had a lot of fun with this. Motor. I mean, it really was pretty much a, you know, it wasn't a great piece of work, but uh, we took it around to different shows and, you know, people were fascinated. And 
again, we just learned, you know, we learned by research and we learned by doing how to make it work. We do a, an extensive amount of mechanical <laughs> design and simulation. So here's a case where this is the one meter mirror again. Um, Kevin Ayat has put in all of the supports, put in the mirror, which is Fusilica, and all of the supports. And, and it looks kind of warped. That's what SolidWorks does because it amplifies the motion um, from some baseline. It amplifies the motion of the parts of the thing you're simulating by, you know, a factor of whatever, a thousand or 10,000. So that's what you're seeing here. So here we've, we've tipped the mirror at a 60 degree angle to gravity. So there's the gravity vector. And um, we, I wrote some software that takes the SOLIDWORKS output of this surface and turns it into a wavefront error, as you can see over here. And you can actually see the little tiny bit of print through from the uh, supports. The mirror is supported at 18 points. And you can actually see those points through the... Um, Print, actually printed through, and and the 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 values are very very tiny, so we're looking at, you know, a change of um, in waves, of what uh, you know, far less than a tenth of a wave there. And not only is Kevin great with SolidWorks, he's also great with machinery. So he put together a system that uses more or less a conventional CNC um, milling machine to mill glass. And so instead of putting um, a standard uh, bit tool in here, we would put a diamond um, grinding tool and we'd actually grind out, we actually grind out the pockets in the back of this. And we take what would have been, I think a 600 pound a piece of glass and turned it into, I think it's 125 pounds. So it makes an enormous difference in the flexure of the telescope. And it probably reduces the weight of a one meter telescope by a factor of three or four, something like that. Here's a close up of the pockets that are ground into the um, uh, primary mirror blank. And we can also see the support points. And the supports are super critical to the performance of the mirror. And one of us, uh, Sh Shelby, uh, he came up with this beautiful idea of how to build the proper support for the mirror. And without the supports, uh, it just doesn't work. And this picture Kevin loves because he was at a trade show. We were actually at a trade show together and we shot glass had a shot, had a display like this. It was a one meter blank that they had made. And it was a fortune. I mean, the, just the blank alone cost uh, a fortune, but, and they had it in this, beautiful display. So Kevin made a display like that for it. I think it's quite beautiful. And there's Kevin. And um, yeah. And there's a one meter telescope. Uh, they're, they're, they get pretty big at this size. Um, all of he's designed all of the electronics goes in here. So um, everything is self contained, you just bring up power and internet, um, um, you know, a, a cable. Uh, and the telescope has everything built into it to make it operate. And um, it's a work of art. This, of course, with software. And software is a huge part of this endeavor. And we have another Kevin. 
Kevin Iverson. And he's our software genius, and he takes care of all of this stuff. He wrote PWI 4, which is our current fully integrated telescope control system. And the hardware control, all that stuff is what goes into a telescope these days. Of course, you've got the mount, but you've also got the focuser, you've got fans, heaters, you know, do heaters, you've got the rotator, derotator. You got temp sensors and a wireless joystick to move it if you want, and cameras. And he also takes care of dome software. I mean, because, you know, we have to make it all work. We actually install these things in a day or two. So we take this big thing in crates and it goes into an observatory and it works that night or the night after. It takes, I think, a team of four of us to, to do that. I've, I never do that, but that's not my job. But they get it done. The observing tools are another part of the, uh, another really, yeah, another really important part of the software. We, I'm, I'm running out of time. I got to um, move a little bit faster here. We build an, um, a model of the telescope and um, we do that by pointing the telescope to different locations in the sky all automatically i wrote uh, a tool called plate solve and it solves the position the pointing position of the telescope by looking at the, the stars in the sky in the image and that information goes into uh, another program that I wrote called Point XP. And Point XP actually um, models the actual motion of the mount with respect of the OTA of the image with respect to the stars. And it all works kind of seamlessly together. And Kevin has incorporated that stuff into the observing tool suite. So this is what plate solve does. It actually finds um, Dave, the you know, yeah. Dave. Yeah. Could I interrupt you here for a second? We've got two or three questions piled up. I think Eric is looking at them right now and getting ready. Um, and you made a comment about, uh, you know, you're running out of time. Actually, you don't run out of time because there's a Sunday like every weekend almost. <laughs> and so if you've got a whole lot more stuff to say, we can have you back. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've got, a, so I've you, got, a, you, I got one more interesting topic after yeah, this. Okay. Which we'll take okay, a okay, yeah. You, let's, let's deal with the question. Okay. Eric, you got some questions over there? Uh, yeah. I'll have to read this one. Uh, if you take your FEA deflections to SIGFIT software, uh, then you can study the light wave uh, wavefront to help look for local uh, symmetric imperfections in the mirror. Uh, do you do something like that? We do exactly that. We take the output from SolidWorks as a CSV file, and we process it as if it were an optical wavefront. In fact, it is an optical wavefront. And so I wrote that tool that um, that takes the output from SolidWorks and turns it into an optical wavefront and shows you all of the aberrations, so astigmatism and coma and all that stuff. So this is an Altaz telescope and you have a D-rotator. How does the accuracy compare to, say, uh, an equatorial mount where you don't have to worry about uh, D-rotation? Um, right. We actually model the D-rotator as part of the whole story. And, well, let me show you the results. I'll, I'll actually get to that here. It's the next slide. So a uh, very appropriate question. Yeah. So after all is said and done, you've done the plate solution, you've moved around the sky, and you've picked up, you know, in this case, 33 calibration points. This is a tip, very typical modeling run for the uh, one meter telescope. 
this first ring is 2.5 arc seconds in radius. And the next ring is five arc seconds in radius. And you can see that the RMS pointing error for all of the points, all 33 of these points, is only 1.1 arc seconds. So in other words, the pointing is basically perfect, and so is the tracking. It's a remarkable way. It's basically computer correcting all of the little flexures and inaccuracies and so forth in um, the hardware, and you just take it all out. So the answer is, is that it's as good as an equatorial mount? I think as far it's as probably, tracking or better? Probably, probably far better. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't have numbers for uh, one meter equatorial telescopes, uh, but, but so I just have these numbers, but I, I suspect based on what I know about mechanics now that it's far better. Yeah. So is there a track? If you're taking an image, you're still tracking, right? Yeah, we, we guarantee um, half an arc second tracking over a five minute exposure. So, you know, basically it's as good as it gets. Uh, and, and often it's way better than that, almost always. Okay. So this technology is really great. I mean, we're basically leveraging all that computing power inside of uh, a laptop, for instance, to making your telescope run point and track perfectly. Okay. And this actually shows you a very typical It shows you a very typical example of that. So here's the, um, here's the result of a, how long did we run this? A 300 second, a five minute exposure. It's completely unguided. We, we no longer guide um, our telescopes. They, they work well enough. And with CMOS cameras, they work really well, you know, because the read noise is low in a CMOS camera that you can take five, 10 minute unguided exposures and just stack them and you get essentially, you know, great images. All right. I love science with small telescopes, but you know what? I don't have enough time to talk about this, unfortunately. So I'm gonna to move to kind of the last thing. By the way, you can, even in even uh, underneath a, a dense atmosphere, you know you can do incredible things with software. Here's an example of image processing where the separation of this this was taken with a a CDK 700. This is a separation of 0.37 arc seconds, um, and it's extremely clear and easy to measure. And here's another example from GVO of a 0.27 arc second um, double. So I did want to touch on this because I know there's a lot of imagers um, in the audience. This is our new offering. It's a stubby little uh, 350 millimeter astrograph that is F3. And it has this kind of optical layout, and it has excellent images across a very wide field of view. Uh, this is a 60 millimeter diameter field of view. And Kevin just sent me this. We're still testing the first prototype. He sent me some images of the horse head um, just from last night. So these are actually our first light of a brand new telescope. And um, the idea here is the same as always. You want to have great stars in the corner. By the way, this is a ASI 6200. So this is a full frame um, CMOS uh, camera. And um, it's looking really good to me. Those stars are super sharp. And even in fairly bad seeing, it has tremendous resolution. And that's what I had for listening. I'm sad it's over. Um, 
we get, we're going to get you back and talk more about that science stuff sometime. Um, <laughs> but we did have a question from uh, Ray, uh, I think it was, about uh, what was it? Uh, um, what other software do you recommend? He, he said that he likes your, I think it was your control software he was talking about. I don't have that screen up. Where is that screen? Um, yeah, we'll get back to it. Okay. Yeah, he was he was talking about the PWI software, and I guess yeah. the question was, what other software uh, do you recommend to use with your systems? Well, uh, a lot of people use um, kind of automatic imaging software um, of various types. Uh, very popular is ACP, um, and I I always enjoyed using ACP. I, I'm kind of a software, I, I love to write software. So I wrote my own stuff for my own purposes, but you know, ACP is a, a great piece of work in my opinion. And it, and it's all talk, it talks through to the telescope through, um, you know, ASCOM. So really anything that talks through ASCOM, not shown on here is another whole world which is ascom and um other other types of interfaces to other programs that's also built into this thing anything else do does plane wave provide uh, collimation calibration services to its customers we we have a lot of information about how to, um, if your scope is out of collimation, how to deal with it. And okay. it's actually another thing that I'm, I'm, I'm actually working on right now for the, the, for the Delta Row 350. That question was from John at Astra. So, and Jeff Weiss wants to know when they'll see pricing on the 350 telescope. Yeah, I don't know. That's not my um, area. You'll have okay. to ask Rick. Okay. I think I think it'll be coming out pretty soon. Um, we're being very careful with the telescope. There's a lot of work to do with the 350. Uh, fast telescopes are and ha have different types of problems that you've got to work on. This one's looking really good at the moment. But I don't, so it, I don't know when we're going to offer we're gonna Is to this going to fit nicely on one of your L mounts or several of the L mounts? I mean, yeah, we're talking about it'll fit wonderfully on the on the L350, but we're also talking about a kind of a new style of mount, and I don't want to give away the details of that. And you can put two or four of these or whatever you want on it. Anything else? Yeah, I don't know. We, did we ever answer the question, what's the perfect telescope? Uh, well, I, think... I don't think there is one. There's, there's no perfect telescope, but there, there's a dream of having something that you can plop down in your backyard like the 350 and turn it on and it calibrates itself and starts working, you know? And if you put, if you put a CDK on that mount, well, you got to... A really good thing it's not nothing's perfect but you know i think we've made a lot of progress towards that a couple of people matthew and howard wants to know um uh so where's that 42 incher right now that that, that yeah, one we saw in the picture i think it's still in the back of perry's truck he actually figured out how to disassemble it and get it in the back of um his dodge ram pickup and as far as I know, it's still there. I haven't actually used it, um, but a few times. Okay. I think, Eric, we got all the questions, don't we? We have all those questions. I think we got everything. Okay. Well, did you all have fun? That was the yeah, that was cool. That was yeah. Fun. And a question from me, do you need any more testers for the 350? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I might be the last one, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. 
But um, yeah, there's a lot of people that want to do some serious testing. And, uh, you know, who knows? Tom, Tom Bardenwepper Werper wants to know, did you ever incorporate adaptive optics? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, um, truly adaptive optics, um, like real AO, like, like the big boys do, it requires very bright stars or a laser guide uh, star or something. There's a lot of problems with adaptive optics, especially for faint stars. Um, it just doesn't work. So um, AO is, is not yet in the realm of the amateur and it probably won't be, you know, but we can do other things. You know, there's image processing tricks that maybe I'll come back and talk about that as a separate topic that can do, you know, pretty wonderful things. Cool. Hey, uh, Dave, can you stop sharing your screen so we can see you better? I sure Just, will. Yeah, because you still got the, the PW14 slide up. Um, well, you know, obviously we'd love to have you back and obviously you've got a brain that could just keep on going. And I want to confirm one thing for the audience that, um, you know how you could put those artificial backgrounds in your um, Zoom presentations and your Google Meet presentations? That's that's actually a real chalkboard back there with real sciencey stuff on it, isn't it? That's actually a calculation I'm doing for optical testing. And um, I, I need a set of polynomials for a specific reason. And I don't want to go into the details. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, everybody, we've been here a while. Um, next week, Randy's coming back and he's going to teach us about sketching. And I love sketching because, I mean, I can't do it, but I love sketching. It's, it's one of the great, um, I think as a visual observer, this astrophotography is bunk. And, and I, you know, deep down inside, I'm a visual observer. I'm a astronomical league. I got 10 or 12 of their merit badges and it's all visual stuff. Um, and what you see in a sketch is more like what you see in an eyepiece than what we see with our astro images. So uh, I know you're all astro imagers and you think, oh yeah, no, the astro images are really, yeah, they are cool. I'll grant you that. But a beautiful sketch like Randy's going to show us next week, that's that's up there. I want to thank Dave for coming today. It was really enlightening. It's just listening to you tell us about all this stuff. So um, don't forget, we always need presenters. So please uh, pitch in if you can. And uh, I think that's it. Are we ready to turn it back over to Molly? Everybody good? Okay, mm -hmm. Molly, you're in charge. All righty. Have a good night, all.